Okay, so let's start. Um, so they're going to do two things. An talk about the analysis, the homework, um, that's what we had trouble with, and then make sure everyone's okay with the concepts too, so I'm just a button pushing, but I'm just saying what, what you're doing. Um, yeah, and it's weird, but that's how I roll. And also talk about diversification models, okay? So learning objectives today. Um, know the distinction between micro and macro evolution. So someone gave you an honest feedback saying, what's the difference? So I'll tell you what the difference is. Um, make sure you can know how to do a comparative analysis. Dig deep into what you're actually doing, making sure you're understanding it. Um, and then talk about why diversification matters, why diversification qu questions matter, and how to investigate them. Okay. Um, but first, two things. If you haven't given me your homework, send it to me now. Okay. Um, so we did, and then if I, if, you get, if I got it early enough, I would send back feedback like, no, try again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I can't do that to you now, but we'll go through it. Um, and then also a quick quiz just to see how you're doing. All right, so there's a question sent to me. Can you explain what is macroevolution? Right? Why is it relevant here? Well, the sort of stuff we're doing at this part of the course is technically called, is usually called macroevolution, right? And so like, like post-tree analysis, so you have your tree, and then we do something cool with it to answer a question, right? But it's technically answering, generally answering macroevolutionary questions. So it could be answering ecological questions too, just controlling for the non-independence thing too, right? Like the independent contrasts, okay? Um, but microevolution is often evolution within species, like the bend part, selection, drift, mutation, right? Macro is evolution between species, short time scales, long time scales, genetics, phylogenetics. Okay, the, this used to be a bigger distinction. Okay, people used to think that the processes that went on with microevolution were completely different from those that happened with macroevolution. Right, so you have little tiny wiggles, and all of a sudden you have these big jumps, and like, okay, I'm going to be a new phylum now, boom, right, and this big change, right. But with the modern synthesis, right. 1950s, 1940s and 50s, people realize that, no, actually what you have is you add up a bunch of this stuff and you get to this stuff, right? A little bit of wiggling as you did, you know, you can have a speciation event, right? A little bit of change, you can, oh, and I've now changed my body plan. I'm a new phylum, okay? <coughs> so now rather than this big distinction, it's more of a continuum, right? Going from mic micro to macro, okay? Um, you know, I work in this area mostly. People who work in genetics work in this area mostly, but there's no clear dividing line anymore. Okay. It also comes up with creationists. You know, they might accept microevolution. You know, dogs change between kinds because we see that, so we can't say that doesn't happen. But macroevolution, a dog can't change to a cat. That's just different kinds. You might come across it there too. Okay. Does that answer the question for whoever, ha whoever had it? The problem with the honest feedback form is like somebody asks me a question, they can't respond because I don't know who, who it was. You know? but. All right. So Boobies on Wolf Island have to contend with a different right, kind so of molestation. Although the island looks like a tropical paradise, <coughs> for this. So diversification. Right. Here are animals and plants. Right. We're ignoring the other things, you know, whatever. Yeah. Fungi, yeah. you know, bacteria. Yeah. With, with, you know, taxonomy there is just really poor. Here it's less poor, right? Um, and look at the distribution of species. What do you see? Lots of insects. Lots of insects, right? Yeah. Uh, if we're looking just at vertebrates, we'd find that one out of, one of every 20 vertebrate species is a cichlid, right? So, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know if you did a test of, you know, are you a sickler or not, you know, it's insignificant, you know, wh whether it's, it's a, you know, it's like greater than 0.05, right? So you can, you have a kind of a test for a sickler, you can say, yeah, it's sickler, and then your model works fine, okay? So you get these, you know, even though they've been evolving for the same amount of time, many groups, you know, we see this, you know, some groups are huge, some groups aren't, okay? Flowering plants, right? So flowering plants... <laughs> <laughs> enough, enough, Anjai. 
I mean, plus, I mean, you na- I mean, cause, like, you guys name the same species multiple things based on whether it's a fruiting body or not. I mean, you know. When you, when you get real taxonomy, then we can talk. You know. <laughs> um. It was like fed mushrooms. Um, so, you know, angiosperms, right? So the beginning of angiosperms, we have a, a divergence, right? Some angiosperms go one way, some go another way at that split, right? One species goes one way, a quarter million species go the other way, arise from the other branch, right? This is really uneven, right? So, if you know, as a biologist, your job is to explain life processes, like what's going on, why does the world look the way it does? I mean, this is an interesting thing to explain. Why do we see this, right? And then you can start saying, okay, why are these ones winning? So is it some certain trait they have that leads to more diversity, okay? And so this leads to diversification studies, right? Looking at why does one have more species than this other group, okay? <coughs> so what people often do is do these statistical comparisons and say, okay, here I have a bunch of sisters, and all the ones on this side have one trait, and the ones on this other side have, the, have this other trait. Okay, and we'll multiple comparisons of this. Okay, and so here we see um, plant plant groups that have latex or resin canals. So think like milkweed, right? So you break up a milkweed, all the all the latex comes out, yucky. Um, as if you're thinking that, you know, might this affect diversification? What would you be, be a hypothesis about that? Should having latex increase or decrease diversification rate, or should it not matter? So what does diversification mean? Like what parameters go into diversification? Mm-hmm. Speciation, what else could it play a role in it? Extinction. extinction, right? So it's both speciation and extinction. Right, so I have one group that's speciating every t- two million years but going extinct every two million years. I expect sort of constant number of species, right? Even if, even if it has twice the speciation or something else, if that one has no extinction, it would be increasing faster. Right, so it's speciation minus extinction, diversification. Okay, so knowing that, Latex canals, what do you think? Give it a shot. I mean, you can only be wrong, right? Darwin's wrong about things, because all I can. Okay. Yes, that's how you test it. What would be your guess going in? Okay, so just, yeah, so, well, okay, so, late, so I'm a plant species, I'm evolving, I evolve latex canals. So should I, you know, if you come back in 10 million years, should I have more species descended from me than from my sister that never evolved latex canals? Yes, people are saying. Okay, why does advantage mean different in diversification? So diversity is because you're survival, but, but why would latex canals so you connect latex canals to diversity? All right, so it's good to be diverse. What? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, so you have more resources. Okay. That's, so it's a good thing. So I mean, this is this 
what I call them, the Martha Stewart School of Diversification Studies. You know, it's it's a good thing. You know, it's Martha. And so this idea that you know, okay, this trait is a good thing, therefore it will lead to more diversity because diversity is a good thing. It's not quite connecting it, right? I mean, you're you're almost there, right? And you're already gone further than most people in this field do. This was like, it's a good thing. Let's see if it increases diversification rate. Yep, it does. Woohoo, right? But connect it to the mechanism, right? Go at the mechanism. Why would you know, being able to have more flowers and more leaves lead to more species. Okay. So good. So that so it allows a greater speciation rate because you have more niches. Okay. Good. That would be one. Another reason people might have is it lowers extinction rate, right? Because sometimes you might go extinct because you have all these herbivores getting you. Well, it might lower the risk of that. So good. So that's, those are two good mechanisms for why you might expect this coupling. So it's all good to think about, you know, rather than just the pattern, why do we get this? Why do we expect this pattern? That's good. Could you say the other way though? Like if you if latex is costly to make, then if you stop making Mm -hmm. Right, so you, could, so you could argue that other way. That's, that's good. Yep. Which you think is right? More? Lower. Lower with, lower with latex? Okay. More with latex? Okay. Raise your hand if you think more with latex. Is this the only thing that's different about the. Ah, so. So, is it well? That's, but the the beauty of sister group comparisons is you don't, right? So, is this the only thing that's different? You know, well, uh, until they, sp you know, we're looking at the whole tree. We're only looking at those parts where one branch went towards latex, one branch didn't, right? And so, um, everything else at that point was held constant, right? Now things could change after that. So maybe the evolution of latex is correlated with being in South America. Okay, yeah, so in this case, it's, it's, it's an addition. It, well, it's an yeah, addition of two, I think. Yeah, I think also in this case, like, where are we, like, on the phylogeny? Because, like, I was talking about, like, these are two species, and you can't really tell them apart. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just the order, like, where are we? So, on, with this type of comparison, it's wherever you can get, you can get this split, right? So I have, you know, five cases of, you know, just a few species, and then I have, this phylum versus this phylum, sure, it's another, it's another data point for my analysis, I'll throw it in there. Yeah. In this case, it's mostly f families. Yeah. Did Brandon talk about, you know, why it's families rather than families? No, okay. Yeah, that's right. We'll you can deal with that later. So again, more more diversity with latex. Raise your hands. Okay, and less. Okay, so let's see. What, so let's see what we're going to do. Then. So what we do is say, okay, here we have various taxa that have latex canals, and then there's a group that doesn't. Okay, and so canal bearing taxon has one. So this group has. 60 or 6, because they don't quite know what the tree is. Regardless, latex loses. Right? Utales versus Wilwitchia. 30 to 1, latex wins. And so forth. Okay? And hooray for latex. Okay? And so this suggests then that those groups that evolve latex, on average, get more diversity. Controlling for everything else. So that's sister group comparisons. Yeah. So is the age when the two sister groups split? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, one potential problem with this is that, you know, they split, and what matters is which of the ancestral states. So if this is not having latex, and this group all has latex, this group doesn't, well, at some point on this branch, they evolve latex, right? But not say right here, it could have been up here. Okay, which limit, which reduces the amount of time for this process to work. Right. Okay, 
that's just a comparison. Here's another one. So again, you know, as grad students should be thinking about how can I get my science paper, right? And so they go to science paper, right? Um, <coughs> and of course, this is 98, right? So you're all in high school or something. Um, <laughs> Even in high school. Yeah. I don't know the people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of high school. Yeah. 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 I'm so old. Uh, <laughs> all right, and so here we're comparing beetles that eat angiosperms versus other beetles, okay? Um, and the idea here is that there's so many beetles because they specialized on eating angiosperms. And angiosperms were radiating really quickly, so beetles, beetles sort of were swept along with them, okay? And you have, like, you know, different host species, different species because of that, okay? And here's a comparison, and they found that, you know, for this one, for example, you know, 10,000, 14,000, 1,000 versus 70, 78. Right, and the statistical comparison test only uses the sign of it, the bit most basic version. Right, so which is bigger, this or this? The fact that it's tens of thousands bigger isn't really used. Okay, you can do more sophisticated tests, but here they were lucky, so they had five comparisons. All five ended up heads, so it's just barely below 0.05. So it's significant. It's a science paper, right? Had one of them flip the other way, it wouldn't have worked. Right, but hey, they're lucky. Okay, so. Here's your comparisons, right? All five work the right way. Significant. Okay, so that's just, that's just comparisons. Any questions about those? And you don't always, I mean, so, you know, one of the ways to do it, so this is, is useful for diversification, but statistical comparisons in general is a good approach for controlling for it's not independence and things like that. Right, so I mean, that's sort of like what was going on with the independent contrast, it's basically statistical group comparisons. Right, but not for diversity, but for traits. Okay, what is, this, what is this equation? Come on, some of you are Paul students. Growth. Yeah. Okay. Population growth, right? Exponential growth. Why is it relevant here? <coughs> it's not the number of trees because we know that increases faster than this. This is kind of slow for me. It's only exponential. All right? But why does it come up here? I start with two species. So, what happens next? We get, we'll get three and then four, yeah, or two and then one and then zero. Right. Yep. So ha have a tree, and at some point we have a speciation event or I have an extinction event. Right. But overall, what I should have is this is the exponential growth or shrinking, right? So if, you know, speciation is greater than extinction, the expectation is exponential increase, right? Think of, you know, bacteria in your vial. You put a bacterial bacterium in, at some point it divides, right? Some also die, but, you know, on average it's a net positive diversification rate. So you have a whole vial full of bacteria, okay? Here I have a whole planet full of species. Right, growing exponentially. Okay. If I assume no extinction, okay, because the math is easier, you only one parameter, yay. Um, this is just called a Yule model. Okay, it's a very old 1920 something model in phylogenetics. Okay, and you just look at how you know, the number of species increases through time on a tree. Okay, and what you can do from this is just like with regular exponential growth the, of a bacterial culture, you can estimate B given N0 and NT, and if you know T, right, you can solve for that. Okay. Divide, move the little thing over, yeah, algebra. Okay. <coughs> On a log plot, right, I expect it to be a straight line, right? So I have, you know, my starting number of taxa, okay? which, depending on how you're running it, is one or two, okay? Do I do it with the first split, or do I do it with the first things pop over? And then I have my slope B. And at this point, I get 
log of n of t. Right. And if I start at 2, it's just log of 2. Okay. So here's my basic model. Okay, so here I have, you know, on my tree, the number of lineages at any point in time, um, and I record the time. Okay, any questions about this so far? Yeah. Uh, is PG anything other than the score that's called? It's the speciation rate. Yeah. Right. So on a given given amount of time, you know, how many species I increase by? What's, what's my rate of, of of growth of species or of you know, bacteria in the culture? Okay. So, you know, for a given value, I can get this. Okay. So this very simple equation was used for looking at a large number of angiosperm groups. Okay, and you know, all you do is get number of species, age, plug and chug, okay. not chug in the UT sense, please, um, and you get these estimates, right? And here we see, you know, so we're assuming extinction rate zero, okay, and we get these estimates for various diversification rates, right? So not diversifying very fast, right? Diversifying pretty fast. Okay. And why is in, why is this interesting? Why are we doing this? It's not even a science paper, it's evolution. Yeah. Why are we doing birth rates in general? Yeah, why 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 do we estimate birth rates? Is it supposed to improve birth rates or just as opposed to watching birds or something? So as biologists trying to explain the world, right? There are a whole lot of flowers in the world. Okay, why are there so many flowers? What this does is give us estimates for different floral groups. You know, water lilies. Are water lilies diversifying really fast or not? Okay, and you can say no. Water lilies not really diversifying pretty fast. Zingiberales, so things like bananas, are. Okay, so, so, so this is not really hypothesis testing. It's more just investigatory. Right? So I'm just looking at like, you know, how many taxa are in a different group. Well, if in an older group, it's expected to have more taxa, right? So this is controlling for that and saying which groups are actually speciating fastest. Okay? And so it allows you to so there's a different way of looking at the world, but it allows you to make hypotheses about like, oh, all the ones that are monocots say are diversifying faster, all the ones that are in South America are diversifying faster. Right? So looking at that sort of question. Okay? And we can also get some sort of expectation, right? So here I have all these different clades, and <coughs> you know, at some point we expect number of species versus age. You know, if if you know, I have a certain slope, right, to all be in this range, right? But I start seeing some outliers, right? And so I can start saying, you know, here are my high diversification rate ones, here are my low diversification rate ones. Okay, so. You know, here are water lilies. Why are water lilies growing so slowly? But um, the base, you know, so the kinds of, the group of legumes evolving so fast. Okay, so we're looking at the world and in investigating that. All right. Any questions about that? What are the two lines? Uh, those are like 95% confidence in uh, well, uh, 95%. I think confidence intervals given the average sort of. There's yeah. two lines and then two dotted lines. Yeah, I, I forget which they what they mean, but they're sort of like confidence intervals, and these are outliers basically. But I should look at that. Okay. 
heavy sigh. It was a heavy sigh. Okay. All right, so Emma's question. So can we plot this, you know, growth through time? Sure we can. And so here we see two lines. One is showing for all the species, right? Even the ones that go extinct. And then I have the ones that are surviving. Okay. And you know, if I'm a paleontologist with a great fossil record, I can get this slope. If I'm like most of us, I can get this slope. Okay. So this is called a lineage through time plot. Okay, LTT. Okay. And the shape of this can give us a lot of information. Okay, so it has the same sort of feel of, of, of tree stretching, right? If I see, you know, this curving down, not curving down, but not keep increasing linearly on a log scale, then the replication rate is slowing down. You can see it going up, replication rate is going up, right? Yeah. So what does that tree represent? Yes, this would be typically be a species tree. So, you know. I was, and this is just showing how you do this, but yeah, but you could imagine this could be a tree of mammals, right? So I have, you know, um, human, chimp, maybe the nobles are finally extinct, you know, um, so forth. Right? Make sense? You could do this for other lineages if you had like a tree of like families or something, but people want you, you almost always do species for this. There's an issue with um, <coughs> if there's extinction. So if you have no extinction, you expect that nice straight line, right? On a log scale linear increase. If there's extinction, you get these deviations, right? Um, and one issue is, you know, I start off with one species or two species. What can happen? Well, I can go up to three, or I can go down to one, and then go down to zero, right? Once I'm down at zero, I don't go back up to one. Right, it's an absorbing boundary. Okay, so it induces this ascertainment bias. Okay, you only see those that survived. Okay, it's like you know, do dolphins rescue humans who fall into the ocean? Well, there's two hypotheses. One is that yes, they do. They push them to shore, and the other is dolphins might like push things in the water for fun. Right, the humans they push to shore survive and say, dolphins saved me. Those they push the other way, don't talk again. <laughs> right, so that's ascertainment bias. Okay, <coughs> so. You have to correct for that, right? You have to say, okay, is it this chance that this is other process is happening? How can I, how do I adjust for that? Yeah. Um, and so you can see sort of how this has an effect. So here we have various simulations, of time plots for a Yule process, right? Pure birth. And here you have the one for same net diversification rate, right? 0 0.1 minus 0, 1 minus 0 0.9, same rate, okay? But this one curves. Okay. Okay. And here we see a plot of ascertainment bias. Okay. So death rate, and you know this is normalized. So we have a constant diversification rate, which is changing the death rate. Okay. Death rate zero. What proportion of clades that go extinct? Zero. Right. I'm sorry about that. When death rate gets really high, you know, I start having many clades go extinct before I see them. Okay, so more more ascertainment bias. Okay. So take the into account. What does linear through top linear through time plots tell me? Okay. So here I have low D, right? Straight. Here I have high death rate. Might as well get this slope. Okay, that's good. This one. These two. What do these mean? Some kind of geological event that caused a, or some kind of event that caused a rate increase in mm -hmm. Right. So going under a you know a pure birth model, say, and now we have a slower rate of evolution, slower diversification rate. Okay. Um, here, we see the rate slowing up, slowing down. Okay, so maybe there's fewer niches, and so it's harder and harder to speciate. Okay. Um, 
And here we see, you know, constant, but then we have a mass extinction, killing many, and it keeps going up. Okay, why don't we see it go down then? This is mass extinction. No, not quite. It's cumulative of those that survived, right? So we're doing only uh, only trees of surviving species, right? So yeah, there's all these branches that are going extinct, but they don't leave any descendants. All we see is the tree, which can only be increasing, because if it decreases, we don't see those ones anymore. Okay. So again, this ascertainment bias issue. And so we have different models we can have we can use. So here are models for this net diversification rate. Okay. And you know, I can have it increasing logarithmically, I can have um, <coughs> you know, models where it increases up where it depends on time. Okay. I can have models where it increases you know is inversely proportional to the number of species. Okay. And just like with our beak depth thing. Right. There we have different models, and we can see which model fits best. Here, same thing. We have different models, see which model fits best. Right. But the models aren't models for character change; they're models for evolution, for speciation and extinction. Okay. Or in this case, just speciation. Okay. So I can say, is speciation density dependent? Does speciation slow down with time? Right. And just like the tree stretching sort of things, here I just have different models, and I just try them and see what the parameter estimates are and see which models fit best. Okay? And so if I think species are involved independently, then I should reject the d density dependent model. Right? Um, if I think mass extinctions don't matter for a certain group, then a mass extinction model shouldn't fit well. Okay? And so we can you know, test these. All right? So here's a case looking at um, some wood warblers. Okay, which model is best here? First. Yep. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And so <coughs> this suggests that warblers are evolving in a model where you know the speciation rate depends on how many other warbler species are around. Okay, so maybe it's based on filling empty niches. Right? Go back to MacArthur and thinking about where warblers are feeding on the trees. Maybe that's actually affecting speciation rate. Right? So it all, all connects. Right? Um, what? It's a long time ago. I didn't do that. Yeah. Now I understand why. Now you're dealing with evolution. It's like, what, what do things do? Now I know why they do it. Um, joke. Okay. Um, and you know, exponential increase. Okay. And so. Yeah, we can see. And so, you know, does a pure birth model fit well? You know, this is not very well at all. Okay, so it's not just species evolving independently in this case. Okay, so now we know something about how warblers are evolving from just fitting these models. Okay. Another thing we can do <coughs> this is more of the investigative science approach. We can estimate, dealing with heterogeneity, we can estimate different rates of different parts of the tree, okay, different diversification rates. And we can find those that are slower than we expect and those that are faster than we expect. Okay, and we can start waving our hands and saying, oh, of course, the new AVs evolve faster than chickens because they can perch better. Right? Um, okay, so the problem, I mean, the problem with this sort of analysis is then your mind is poisoned, right? So you know what the answer is, the what the pattern is, I'm trying to figure out exp you know, examples. Yeah. On that tree, is it is it like standardized for age? Do you have like diversification rates for like elephants versus dung beetles? Like you're gonna see differences because elephants have a way longer lifespan than dung beetles do. So can you like? So do you think? But so that's a question. So I mean, if you think speciation rate should be affected by generation time, you could test for that these models, right? So that you could do sort of something like, like a tree stretching thing. Um, people haven't looked at that very much so far. I mean, they might do a correlation between generation time and speciation rate. So you could do that. You could say, okay, 
Here I have all these different estimates of diversification rate. Let me co and all these groups are independent of each other. Let me and actually they're not quite independent of each other, but let's assume that for now. And then you could just do a, a regression a regression against that and test it. Um, and actually there are approaches like in, similar to independent contrast, but called crunch and brunch for dealing with um, based on how you assign uncertainty and things. Um, not uncertainty, but how you how you group taxa. Um, that allow you to test for does this character lead to higher diversification rate or not. Do that. But there are better approaches than that now we'll talk about in a sec. Yeah. But good. Yeah, it's a good test for that. Other questions about this? Okay. One other thing to note is here's a case where it can be very hard to estimate certain parameters, right? So Estimating net diversification rate, okay, I know when the group started, I know how, how many taxes there are, great, I can estimate that. Um, and that's R here, okay? And I can see, you know, as I move this way, you know, here's a contour plot on the likelihood surface, so like a contour map, right? And here it's pretty steep, right? Drops off, okay. But extinction fraction, you know, I'm based on, based on things I don't see, right? Missing, missing data. So there's a lot more uncertainty in that, okay? And so you can see, I can move a bit this way without changing the likelihood very much. Okay, and sometimes you get almost like a ridge here. So there's a lot, often a lot of uncertainty in estimates of extinction fraction or extinction rate. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now, one thing people often ask is, you know, does this trait lead to high rates of diversification? Right. So, like. You know, like our latex canals example. Okay. Now that works if you have lots of sister, lots of sister group comparisons. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so here I have, you know, this sister group comparison, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and you know, not this one, because I here I have one versus a whole lot, but this whole lot includes both black and white. Right? And so oftentimes you'll get this where you have this mixture of states. And so you can't really do a statistical comparison very easily. Okay, so what can you do instead? We can use the model we're going to talk about in a second. Okay. Um, but one other thing that matters here is that there's this bias. Okay. So if I just said, okay, here I have um, black and white effect affect speciation rate, okay, but they don't affect character change rate, okay? Equal rates are going from, from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0, okay? If I didn't tell you that and said, okay, let's put this into our discrete models and estimate, you know, back to our, our little matrices, our little boxes, right? Rate of going from 0 to 1, rate of going from 1 to 0. What would you conclude from this tree? Uh, would you say that actually? Which do I have more of? Black. Okay. How do I get black? Right. Yep. So here I have, let's say, okay, zero, oh, white and black, okay. White and black, okay. And the way I can get this rate difference is I have a much bigger rate this way than this way. Right? People see that? Okay. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, what? Going from white to black. Right, this is how I get this unevenness. Yes or no? You like? No. Okay. It happened one time. Right. It matter what happened. So well, yeah, so it happened right there, then it went back to white multiple times. Right. So if it happened once, and this were all black, right? I still have some information that these haven't hopped back to white, right? So it gives you some information that the white to black rate, the, the black to white rate isn't that high. But I don't have a lot of information about the white to black rate. 
But here, since I do have a mixture of white and black. But those are all black going to white. So it's, um, right, so it could be all black going to white. But then I have white not going to black here and white not going to black here. So there's information about all those rates. Yep. Okay. So right, so you conclude uneven rates. Right? But the truth is equal rates. So what's actually happening is that those that go into the black state speciate faster. This is more of them. Okay? But by ignoring that, I get the wrong estimate about transition rates. Okay. Um, let's get that. Um, let's get that one. Okay. Now, this one. Okay. Here I have equal speciation rates, unequal transition rates. Right. For I doing this under a speciation model, which group has a faster speciation rate? Would you think? If I assume transition rates are equal. Black. There's a lot more black ones. So it's going to be speciating faster. Okay? So by ignoring the character rate change, assuming that's equal, I get the wrong answer about speciation. Okay? So everything we've been doing, talking about so far in the course has been, you know, assuming character change is independent of speciation rate. Right? Or assuming we're looking at only speciation rate changes and, and assuming the character change is constant, right? But it, depending on what's hap happening, by ignoring one, I get the wrong answer about the other. Okay, what do you do about that? Well, if you're like most biologists, you know, hope, publish, right? Ignore it. Use existing models. Okay. It wasn't this, this wasn't even picked up as a problem until 2006. So I didn't really think about this very much as a problem until 2006. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Good. Um, so this came up in 2007. Okay. So this is fresh stuff. Right. So this is the BISI approach. Okay. So here's the basic model. I have transition rates between zero and one. Right. And here's where I also have a speciation rate, so which also makes more zero, and extinction rate, which makes fewer zero. Okay. And same thing here. Okay. So now I have six parameters. Yeah. BISI. B i s s e. And this was published in 2007. Okay. No. <laughs> but it's still worth thinking about. Yeah. Uh, Madison, Otto, and Fitzjohn. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'm going to be hungry for papers. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that helps, I mean, methods papers get cited a lot, and so that's a good thing, too. Okay, so here's the basic model. So now, if I have, you know, a different transition rate, you know, I can estimate that, and I can estimate these too. Now, you should be worried though, because I just said earlier, extinction rate's hard to estimate well, right? So, will this work? And so, you know, looking at speciation rates, you know, then this is with, you know, uh, here th these lines show the true values. Okay, and these are trees of 500 species. So big, you know, pretty big trees. I mean, m you know, my dissertation, I had a tree of like 30 species, right? I have a friend who makes trees of 10,000 species. So, I mean, big, this, what, what, what is big keeps changing, right? But 500 species is still a pretty good tree nowadays, right? And here's what you get for speciation rates with that. Here's how you do with extinction rates. Okay? So, not as good, right? together okay <coughs> and of course the other thing <coughs> the other thing in that model is state change rates okay and one thing to think about is you know if the true values are further apart it'd be easier to tell them apart too right this is sort of a power issue right they're very different it's easier to tell them apart okay and then it's also transition rates okay and again you, know, you can pick out some differences there okay and so 
This is just that you need you need a fair number of taxes for, to do this. Once you have that number, you can actually separately estimate these rates. Okay, and there's been some modifications of this to deal with not just binary traits because because I mean you already can think like okay, well I can do two two traits, I can do you know three states, I can do four states. You can just figure out how you can just change the matrix size, right? So if people figured out they can do that too. So they've changed that. Um, and the other issue is for this to work. You need to have, uh, the original approach you had to have, have a full phylogeny, every single extant species. Okay. You often don't have that, right? So the species is in Iran. You know, you're not going to go to Iran to get that species. It's going to be missing from your tree, right? In my case, there are, there are species that were now under a parking lot in Los Angeles. You know, they're gone. Okay. Um, <coughs> so can kind of complete phylogeny. Um, and I've made it so that if you have random sampling, it can work. Okay, or if you have all the species um, but don't have resolution everywhere, it can still work. So can say, okay, I have this family that has 15 species, but I don't know how it's resolved within that family. It can still work for that. You can't do something like this where you have, um, you know, you know, some sort of rank, you know, some non monophyletic group, or if you have, or if you have a bias towards, I only get those that are, that are you know, temperate because I live in a temperate region, and that sort of bias is hard to deal with. But here's an example of how it's used. Okay. <coughs> so here's looking at self incompatibility in plants. Okay. What's self incompatibility? Can't, Can't breed with yourself, right? So pollen lands on your own stigma. It says, ah, nothing happens, right? And actually, there's a whole bunch of different genes that play a role in this self recognition. Okay, it's a very complex process. Um, and the idea is that, you know. You can go from self incompatible to self compatible by having this complex system break down. Right? So no one recognizes, oh, that's me, and then this pollen tube grows and fertilizes. Okay? So there's you know, potentially this rate going this way, okay? but then there are extinction rates and speciation rates in each two. Okay? And so this paper had analyzed <coughs> um, uh, net diversification rate. Okay? In each, and found that self-incompatible had a higher net diversification rate. In fact, compatible ones had a negative diversification rate. Okay, so if you're self-compatible, you went extinct faster than you went faster than you speciated. Okay. So why are there self-compatible species? If you look in this tree, and you know the the green ones are self-compatible, right? So this leads to you going extinct faster than you speciate. Seems like a bad idea. Right? Why is that still present? Right, so it could be, could be that, right? So non equilibrium dynamics, right? There hasn't been enough time. So we have a paper we're just about to submit that looks at floral evolution and finds that, you know, 136 million years after flowers evolved, the influence of the, what their ancestral like floral symmetry was is still felt today. So bilateral symmetry evolves has faster species has faster diversification rate. Not everything's bilateral because it's still taking a while for all those ones that were radial symmetric to um, respond slower. Okay, this is this long term signal it takes a while. So it could be that. Um, what else? Mm-hmm. So some of the self-compatible ones could be could be theoretically self-compatible, but actually self-incompatible in practice, right? If that were the case, though, then they'd still be in this set. Or just like more often than not, like things like breeding like other members of their same species, not like their individual not all the time. Right. But if that, I mean, again, so they could be only you know self-compatible some of the time. But still, even though they're, you know, even if this one's self-compatible only 10% like of the time, or does that, you know, 1% of the time, it's still in this pool, which overall has this estimated rate. Yeah. You have increased variation when you outcross. So right. would that play a role in it? So even though you have a negative extinction rate, you're still getting more variation in your population, so you're still having a subset that is fit enough to be extinct. So you could, right, I mean, you could be being driven that way by natural selection in the population, 
right? And so that's actually this parameter here, right? So, yeah, I mean, if it, overall, you still diversify at a slower rate. But basically, you keep replenishing that by natural selection or by, you know, loss of complex gene function going from self-incompatible to self-compatible. Right? That makes sense? Okay. So, um, you know, it's like monks in the Middle Ages, right? They're not having kids, right? So how, how do they still have monks? Well, because, you know, their sisters and brothers keep having kids and some of them become monks, right? Same idea here, okay? Um, so these are the, you know, the ones that are breeding and they keep, you know, spitting out some monks that survive for a while, but on the average will go extinct, okay? And this, this interplay between speciation rate and transition rate, you can only do if you look at them both jointly, right? If you look at the single, you might get the wrong answer, okay? And assume it's just transition rate or just diversification rate, okay? So this whole set of models is in a package in R called diversity. Okay, it was done by a grad student, just like you. Yeah. Um, and it does, you know, this model is a continuous model, it's a geographic model. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so that's this approach. Okay. And so my feeling is, personally, this, this is something like independent contrast, where we know we should do it this way, right? But it's hard to do still. So we might have to use the other approaches for a while. But at some point, you know, if we think a trait has effect on diversification rate or is correlated with a trait that does, right, then it, we might have to use it. Okay? Any questions about any of this? Okay. All right, well, it will be online.